Okay, welcome to episode three of Speaking for Water. In today's episode, we travel to Hawaii and meet Jay Greiner. Jay is an expert free diver and amazing photographer. He specializes in underwater photography, dolphins, and other sea life. That's just out of this world. Please join us now. Can you hear me? I can hear you, sir. Great to hear. All from right. You. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Excellent. What? Excellent. What's up? Oh, just uh, living that North Carolina dream. How is it where you are in the whole Loa state? Yeah, it's good. We've uh, had a rough, I would say, the month of February and March have been very windy and very rainy. Parts of the North Shore got flooded. Um, we had to evacuate. The I would I would say that the weather has been very moody here, but I think it's it's uh, it's doing better uh, at least the past couple of days. Um, so uh, yeah, sunshine is back. <laughs> Excellent. Has that put a damper on your photo taking? Um, yeah, I haven't been shooting very much. Um, there's a couple of little windows of decent, um, you know, just de decent weather, but just mostly editing, um, shooting a lot more above water, but really haven't been, been in the water as much as I normally am. And I'm just get back out there. It's, it's a struggle, you know, it's so much a part of your life and, uh, conditions, you know, just aren't very, very you know open so it's 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 a little bit of a frustrating time but it makes me appreciate it even more you know once the weather comes back and gets better and you're able to get out there you appreciate it more you know um we have great weather here some of the best weather in the world so we can easily take it for granted um so it's been a nice change you know it's it's been a nice change the past couple of weeks um but definitely ready for the back you know, the uh the hawaii weather Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with me, speak with us. Uh, again, what this uh, program is all about is bringing the, the greatest to, to the, uh, the people to get a better understanding of how, how you do your craft, um, what makes you tick, and uh, how it is that you, you bring such a amazing light to, to this world. So um, again, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a, a, a pleasure, a privilege. I always enjoy talking about things that, you know, that I'm passionate about. Um, so yeah, we can get it right in. Sick. Uh, excellent. Well, why don't we first start, tell us a little bit about your, your setup, where you are, what the beach is like, where you, where you live, uh, maybe a little bit about the surf break around you. Sure. Yeah. I'm uh, on the Southeast part of Oahu. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I'm um, just kind of up the mountain from Diamond Head. So the summer times we get the swells down here on the south side of the shore. East is a little bit tricky, but primarily summer. So summer times I'm usually shooting at Sandy Beach, which is, you know, kind of down the road a little bit more east. It's a fun shore break spot. Um, but the beaches down here, I'm, I'm kind of close to Waikiki, kind of soft, uh, mushy waves. Um, but in the summer, we can get some good swell. So it's nothing comparable to the north and the west side. Um, in, the, in the summer, it's actually really flat on the north shore. So that's when I usually will go up and shoot at Waimea. We'll do some underwater stuff. We'll uh, shoot at Shark's Cove, some of the fun caves, underwater caves out there, which is a lot of fun. Always sea life. You know, they've got the dolphins and the honus fish and um the winter time we usually get the whales so we're just kind of at the tail end of the humpback whales that migrate here um usually during the months of i'd say february to about march april um but in the winter time the north shore is firing uh this winter was pretty pretty incredible um so i'm about 45 minutes from the north shore so i just hop right over and just go right through the middle of the island and shoot up there um well in good conditions um or then we we'll also i just shoot a lot on the west side too. so not too much in town um i have my favorite little surf breaks in town here uh right by diamond head by lighthouse there's a break called tongs it's probably one of my favorite breaks um kind of just nice soft easy waves for the most part but this summer you know in the next couple couple months it should start getting more of that south swell and I see on your Instagram feed that you're also a surfer in addition to a photographer. Does the uh, surfing ever conflict uh, emotionally with, uh, with what it is that you are, are wanting to do? Yeah, I would say I take surfing a little bit less serious. Um, I, 
I, I, I don't surf big waves. I'm not surfing pipe. I'm not surfing Waimea. Um, but I kind of use surfing sort of as just like a, an outlet. Um, it, it, you know, it sounds cliche, but it, it really helps more with my creativity to just get out and not have an agenda and not have, you know, any kind of competitive spirit um, getting waves. Uh, I, I find surfing as just a very just happy, fun, relaxing um, uh, thing for me to do. Um, some people take it a lot more serious. Um, I just kind of cruise on the shoulders and all, you know, take different waves. But um, the surfing aspect is more kind of like taking a break, taking a break from the creative side. It allows me kind of free my mind a little bit more. Socially, it's fun. It's always fun just to surf with a group of friends. We just get these little pockets and we just, you know, party waves and just um, have more fun with it. Uh, and, and, and it's it's not like there's any pressure to get a certain spot or for the conditions to be perfect. If the conditions aren't good, it's like, ah, we'll just go get an acai bowl or just, you know, sit out and, and, and just watch watch the sunset. Um, so it doesn't interfere at all with the photography side. If anything, it's kind of like an escape, like an outlet to just uh, to just enjoy the waves from a different perspective. And I mean, as you know, I mean, just that feeling of dropping in and riding a wave, taking a couple of turns, it's just, uh, there's nothing like it. So um, it's always going to be a part of my life for sure. Do you find a, a most aesthetic enlightenment when you're without the camera in the ocean surfing that you say to yourself, well, maybe when I reapproach the ocean next time with my camera, I'm going to, I'm going to come and try to get that, what I saw maybe when I was surfing? Um, yeah, a, a little bit. I don't know as far as imagining a shot or some kind of creative clip or, or, or video, you know, when I'm out there, it's more thinking as opposed to visualizing and imagining, you know, what I want to capture next. Um, because being on from that perspective, um, I'm not underwater and sitting above and just watching the waves. Uh, that helps, you know, just kind of seeing the formations. Um, looking at the mountains is is one of the most beautiful things to do when you know you're sitting there watching the sets come in. Um, so I think it's more of a mental escape than it is really a visual uh, inspiration, if that makes sense. Hundred percent. Uh, I, I want to take us uh, back. I want to rewind a little bit. Can you can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your your parents, um, how it is that that you uh, got to where you are today with the foundation that they delivered to you in those early years? Yeah, wow. There's a lot of layers to that. Um, my family. I was born and actually born and raised in in New Jersey. Um, I graduated high school and moved to Georgia. I went to um, college there. And then I decided to pursue um, uh, grad school and I became a, a doctor of physical therapy um, in Florida. And I mean, my, my, my dad's a teacher, my mom's a nurse. She inspired me in the medical way, um, but my dad was very into athletics. He played college football and he was a, coached me all through, you know, middle school, elementary school, um, high school, and just learning, you know, just teamwork and, and working hard and being committed, um, having a healthy lifestyle, being active. We would go to the, we'd go to the shore and we, you know, just body surf and um, we, just learning just to enjoy life. Um, my parents are amazing inspiration to me. Um, I, I could not, you know, think of any better set of parents than, than what, you know, I've been given. I'm very grateful for that. Um, I have two sisters that live in Georgia now, and both my parents live in Georgia. Um, it, as far as the creative side, not too much of an artistic family, I would say. Um, my sisters have a little bit more of artistic view um, just with creative stuff, um, even how like they design their house or like, you know, think about the decor and, and staging different things. They're very good at that. Um, so I would say it's more of the athletic part that I've instilled from my parents. Um, and, and so, you know, the way that I'm able to get in, in the water and able to dive in and to surf and to fight some currents and crazy waves, um, I attribute that more towards just my upbringing of being in a gym, um, 
working hard, always being in real good health. I played football, I played basketball, I played baseball, pretty much any sport with a ball I, I, I dabbed in um, when, you know, when I grew up. But um, the artistic side kind of started to come out a little bit more in my high school uh, years. Um, I took some creative classes, some videography classes, and that's kind of where it sort of started. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of how everything kind of began. And then moving out here, uh, I moved out here August 2011. So I'm coming up on, on uh, yeah, 10 years. It's crazy how fast time flies. Um, Hawaii, I would describe as a very, it's a very creative place to be. I think dance wise, I think music wise, I think imagery, photography, videography, um, it, it just, I don't know, it just fosters that creativity. Uh, being surrounded by such beauty um, and then culturally it's a very artistic culture um, and I so you know moving here really kind of took what I learned in high school and kind of started then and ignited and then it just kind of blossomed into this whole different um, lifestyle and perspective that had it been anywhere else I don't think I would be inspired the way that I am here um, you know, in the Hawaiian culture and in the Hawaiian islands and just uh, everything that it has to offer. Awesome. So you went to Hawaii taking pictures or was that kind of uh, something that, that you didn't do too much of beforehand? How did that lineage go? Yeah, great question. Um, I actually finished PT school in, in 2011 in Florida and uh, I got accepted into an orthopedic residency that was based here. Um, so I moved out here, kind of playing around with the camera, but I was really focused on the residency. Um, I'd work Monday to Friday. I was doing research articles on the weekends and studying and taking exams. It was a hard place to do a residency to concentrate with all the distractions of the hikes and the sunsets and the surf and all the marine life. Um, and, you know, my perspective took a huge turn. Um, there's a lot to this story, but I'll just kind of you know, just kind of keep it as short as I can, but- Take your um, time. I, what's that? I said, take your time. Okay. So yeah, um, and it's a little bit emotional for me. Um, I was in a pretty severe accident. I had a, I was driving a moped. It was like a Sunday night and um, I don't have any idea what happened, but I woke up in the neuro ICU with a pretty, pretty severe traumatic brain injury with a skull fracture and um, a lot of other things, and I, it, it it was a it was a pretty trying time. My family came out here and took care of me for a couple of weeks, and then I actually had to leave Hawaii. I had to give up everything, my residency, um, my place of living, not knowing what was going to happen. And I moved back to Georgia, uh, just you know, just for recovery. I went through a lot of like just kind of neurological um, rehab, and you know, my life took a complete turn. Um, I, there was a time that I wasn't able to read. I couldn't exercise, I couldn't drive. I had vertigo, I had so much pain, so much headaches. I was on seizure medication. Um, and so those four months that I lived at home was covered with just a bunch of prayer, a um, bunch of love from my family. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents during the day. And then my mom and dad would come pick me up after work and then we'd have dinner, we'd watch sunset and just the same thing, you know, uh, for four months. And so that really um, affected me in a lot of different ways, changed my perspective on life. I mean, I should have died. I, it was, the neurologist said 80 to 90% of people that presented like me would have either been vegetables or would not have made it. Um, and the re reason why that I, you know, recovered the way that I did, which the neurologists were just like baffled by, um, even just looking at my MRI, how much, how much blood, how much damage, um, all the way down into my neck, uh, just bruising. Um, I, I, it was really the, the, the fact that my skull fractured is what allowed the pressure from, you know, the increased swelling and in blood to escape. Um, had it not be, it would have just built up more pressure inside of my, my cranium and probably would have cut off a lot of arteries, a lot of um, damage to, to the tissues. Um, but it was the, the fact that my skull fractured, um, which in most cases they would actually do surgery, emergency surgery, where they would relieve that pressure from, from your, but um, I was found 30 feet from my moped um, and taken to the hospital. And, um, you know, four months later, 
I was like, well, you know what? Like, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to let this affect as much as I already had. Um, I'm going to push on. And I probably moved back sooner than I should have. But transitioning now into being in Hawaii, I, I, I wasn't able to work um, full time. Just cognitively, I just could not handle a full time schedule. Uh, if you think about those days where you're just at a mental block, where you can't really handle too much, you're stressed, you're overrun. That's how every day was for me. And so I started working three hour days and then I'd work four hour days and progress to, I think I was working like five hour days. And the rest of my time I spent in the ocean. I had so much free time. So every sunrise I'd wake up and I just bought a little GoPro. The, I think it was like Hero One. It was like the first GoPro. And I would go to Sandy Beach and I would just play in the waves. It was just such a, an escape for me from the crazy commotion of life with noise and emails and texts and TV and just like, it was just sensory overload so much that the ocean was a way for me to escape that. And it was almost like it kind of embraced me and it became such a healing process for me to um, relieve a lot of that stress physically um, which then transitioned to relieving the stress mentally, um, which just gave me uh, peace. And, and, and the more that you spend time, you know, with something, you notice the details and the textures and the colors and just the beauty of it. And so, uh, you know, picking up the GoPro and just playing around with that and sending the pictures to my friends or to my mom and dad, they were just like, Hey, like, this is awesome. Like, this is so cool. Like, like, and I'm like, really? It was like, all right, just, you know, kind of playing around. And that's kind of where it all started was, was, was kind of coming back here after my traumatic head injury and then using the ocean as therapy, becoming so infatuated and so in love and so grateful for it, wanting to share that with other people because I see what it's done to me. Um, and the best way that I'm able to share that is by capturing with the camera and then sharing it with 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 whoever you know gets inspired by it totally totally epic story it sounds like the work has almost brought you to uh, another level of existence and even i might i say saved your life yeah absolutely absolutely i with, without a doubt and and when, when you are able to experience something like that uh, a part of nature some people it's the hikes it's waterfalls some people it's birds some people it's trees it's you know, for me, the ocean is just a way that uh, really just gets to me. And, and like I said, when, when I see the power that it's had in me and my healing process, it's something that you don't want to keep to yourself and you can't help but want to share that with other people because you see its potential. You've witnessed firsthand what it's capable of doing. Um, and you just want other people to be able to experience that, whether they live in Wisconsin or they live in Japan or they live in South Florida, like, you know, anybody that can appreciate the, the perspectives that I'm able to capture with the camera, then I'm all for it. So that's what really drives me, you know, that's what, that's what inspires me, um, is that I want people to experience it the way that I've experienced it and that I continue to experience it. So well said and so true on so many levels. Uh, I want to go back to the GoPro. So you 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 get the GoPro. You're taking uh, mainly shore break photos. It sounds like is that is that correct? Yeah. So how do you go um, in that transition to all right? I think I'm going to go get an SLR. Uh, SLR. I'm going to then put it in a really expensive Aquatech housing. Um, I'm yeah. now going to start free diving super deep. Um, how does that progress? Totally. Yeah. So I went from the hero two, and then I was like, Oh, the hero, the hero or the hero one. Then I said, Oh, the hero two. Oh, it shoots this burst per second. So I'd be able to get more frames with the shore breaks because of the timing is it's so fast. Right. And so like you want to get every little drop is. So if you're getting five frames per second versus you can get 10 frames per second or eight, the, the shots that you're able to get are have so much more of, a, of an opportunity to do that. So transition from GoPro to DSLR, one of my friends, he was, I would say he's like my, my photography mentor. Um, his name is Ryan. He, he, he really guided me into like, okay, you, you, you're able to use the GoPro. You can get in the right position you can capture great things. But if you want to capture greater things, you're going to have to step up. And I'm like, well, I have no idea what camera to get. 
so he was like well get you know let's let's he said i shoot nikon but you know try a canon so then i started with a canon 7d and then that let me see hold on um sorry my lighting went out here let me just change this um so i went to uh, a canon 7d and then i hopped in with a, a a water housing company in bali it was basically the cheapest most efficient way for me to step up my game i wasn't going to get big you know some of these big rigs these big nautic cams big dome ports with these big you know the canon 1dx and like you know those i was just like on a budget i was only working you know five hours a day um as a resident which we don't make hardly anything um and so yeah i just transitioned to a dslr the 7d and then it's like okay same thing with the gopro okay you want to capture more you want to get you know start shooting in raw you want to start shooting um and editing in a, a program more than just iphoto and um so it just kind of i basically took what i had and kind of just expired it and then it's like okay i can't get what i want now so i need to step up um, and as far as the photography goes, as you know, when you go into from, you know, GoPro, which just, you know, shoots pretty regular, it's editing it pretty much for you. You're not changing the settings too much. Now, I mean, now the GoPros are incredible. And especially the way they shoot video is just unbelievable. Um, but at that time, um, I picked up the camera and I really didn't know what I was doing because there's so many aspects of the DSLR that you can change versus what you do with the GoPro. Well, at that time, it was just a JPEG. I'd push a button and it would go beep, beep, beep. And I got three photos, you know, with the DSLR. I learned really by doing it the wrong way, I would say. Like I didn't take photography classes. I really didn't even read too much into it. I would just take it out and I would just randomly set a shutter, an ISO, an aperture, and an aspect ratio. And I was just shooting, I was like, okay, I get back and all my photos are washed out <laughs> or they're blurry or they're out of focus. I'm like, okay, what did I do wrong? All right, let me change this. Let me change this. And a lot of what I've learned is through other people, um, just talking with them when they're shooting in the shore breaks. Hey, uh, you know, what, what do you think about this setting? Or um, I have this lens. What do you guys think about, you know, this lens? And so I would just say that, yeah, I, I just learned by doing the hard or doing it the wrong way. But I think that was so effective for me because I understood the process. I understood the value. It's not like I just showed up to a class and everybody taught me, okay, do this setting, this setting, this setting, this setting, and all these different environments. And then I go and do it and then I got it. But it, it just by doing it the wrong way, it takes longer to figure it out. But I feel, I feel like it's been more effective to me because I kind of now know what not to do, if that makes sense. Um, and so the transition, it took time, I would say a couple of years. Um, and then shooting a lot of the similar locations with the similar lighting helped me perfect that a lot too um shooting pretty much the same time of the day the same spot and the same angle obviously the weather changes the wind changes the waves change but i kind of found my sweet spot um and then you know a lot of my transition from shooting shore break into more free diving and you know ocean life and marine and even conservation has come through a lot of the relationships that I've been able to form here. Hawaii, I would say it's not necessarily a place that it's what you know, it's really who you know, and it's very relational. And at that time, you know, when I was recovering from my head injury, I was like a little kid, just wanting to meet everybody, wanting to talk to people. Like, even I remember like in the lineup, I'd be like, hey, what's your name? My name is Jay, what do you like to do? Let's go grab coffee. And, and that, that's what really built a lot of my relationships now with the people um, that are just so talented and so successful and just on a whole different level um, that I thankfully have, have taken me under and say, hey, yeah, let's go shoot. Here, come out on the boat with us. Or, you know, I want to teach you, you know, um, you know, how to do better free diving. Um, I've gotten to meet just some amazing people um, that are very good at what they do and, uh, and just learn from them. Um, so no, I wouldn't say it's really a formal training when it comes to photography or free diving or even just creating a lot of it's just been, you know, basically creating those relationships with those people that know those avenues so well, um, that, you know, thankfully have, you know, allowed to, you know, help me and collaborate with me and, and work together. And it's all about respecting each other, you know, respecting each other's, you know, creativity and, and, and their thing. And, um 
it's been a it's been a fun journey you know and out here there's just so much talent um that you know if you get in with the right crowd and the right people um you can learn so much and i and i now i see you know what they've done for me and i i love you know helping and talking to other people too because you know similar to how the ocean has affected me i see how these people have affected me that um I, I love, you know, stuff like this and being able to just share um, the process and, and also, you know, the things that I've learned as far as editing and, 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 and creating. Super epic. Great, great advice. Um, can you please tell us the story that um, the first time that you entered the sea life arena? So uh, I, I'm, I, I look at your Instagram feed and I just see these insane photos of dolphins, whales. What was that first experience where you where you went under and you're like, "Wow, I just got that!" Like that is just it was epic. Um, what what was that day like? To, to, can can you share? Oh man, it's hard to say a specific day, but I remember one of my friends. He he had friends that knew a spot where we could go to try to find some spinner dolphins. And this spot was pretty hidden. It was before it got kind of big on social media. Um, and I remember going out there and, and, and being able to hear their little squeaks and whistles before you even see them is a pretty, a pretty chilling kind of uh, experience for the first time. Above um, or under the water? Under the water. So we're swimming out there and all of a sudden we hear the squeaks and whistles. We're like, they're somewhere around here. They're, they're, they gotta be close by and it gets louder and louder. And all of a sudden out of the distance, you see these shadows of just fins and just massive pot of spinner dolphins. And they swam right, like we were just treading water, talking and kind of killing time. It was a really good visibility day. So we were just kind of doing creative stuff underwater, like blowing bubble rings or like doing little rock runnings and just kind of, you know, just getting creative, playing, playing around, nothing formal. Um, and then, yeah, well, as soon as we heard them and then they swam right in between us and just flipping and playing. And that was just like, holy crap, like this isn't SeaWorld. This isn't an aquarium. This is as natural as it can be, which made it all the better. It was unexpected. Uh, we didn't you know, pursue them or swim after them or try to chase them or drive a boat and jump in. And, you know, we didn't do that. We just sat on the shore and we just said, hey, let's just go swim. And then all of a sudden this pod just came right by. Um, that sparked my interest in, in marine life for sure. We see turtles all the time. Um, sometimes we'll get some spotted eagle rays. They're a little bit finicky, kind of in and out. But at that time, we you know, it, it definitely sparked my uh, curiosity for more ocean life. But then I started seeing these whale spouts. I think it was like a year later, I started seeing these whale spouts. And I remember hiking Cocoa Head one morning and looking out into the distance. It was a sunrise, a beautiful sunrise. And all of a sudden I see these whales breaching and these spouts. And I was just like, I thought, I remember, I remember exactly where I was sitting there on the rock looking at the horizon and I just said, I want to, I want to see these things. I, I want to swim with these, with these creatures. These, they're, they're so mysterious, uh, so huge, so beautiful. And it sparked my interest to kind of follow and to, and to talk to people that have experienced the humpback whales. And my first uh, time that I was able to get out and, and, and see them, I went over to uh, Tonga, uh, Vavau, um, and I was able to do some work over there um with a, a guy named Darren Jew uh, I don't know if you've heard of him but he's an incredible photographer I mean we're talking like Nat Geo just unbelievable so that's what um you know just seeing the the dolphins and I'm not saying that the dolphins aren't crazy beautiful and amazing because it never gets old seeing them um but that's what made me think okay what else can I see underwater and so that's how I kind of transitioned more to the whales and the sharks are a whole different, different thing too. <laughs> now, when you do the sharks, are, are you in a shark cage or are you uh, in, in your natural environment? No, we're free diving. I've done the shark cage one time 
and no offense to you know people that do shark cage i mean it depends on the environment and what species of sharks you're with obviously um but the shark cage to me it very clustered and you have a like five or six people in the cage and they're all kicking and then the cage and then you see the shark swim by which is cool but like the cage to me it kind of miscommunicated that these are not man-eating monsters and in the cage it made me feel like they were it made me feel like you had to be in a cage in order to interact with a shark because if you don't they're going to eat you and I did it one time and I was like I I, 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 I'm not really, I, I just didn't like seeing them from that perspective. Um, and so, yeah, when we do the shark stuff here, where, I mean, we're very careful, very cautious with the people that have studied these sharks for plenty of years. Um, and the stuff we do in Tahiti, it's, it's the same thing. Um, you know, with the tigers and the Galapagos and then the sandbars, the scalp hammerheads. Um, but it's very important to, you know, understand their potential, understand, you know, the way that they communicate, um, identifying that communication and knowing when you should not be in the water and, you know, when it's okay. Um, they're very smart creatures. They're, uh, noticing these, these little changes on how they're approaching, how they're swimming, even just how close they are to the surface. Um, versus how low they are to the surface all of that communicates different things and if you don't know what you're doing then you probably should stay in the cage um, but like I said before um, yeah the, the free diving but we're with people that um, that know these animals very very well and there's even times that we've been out with them where we're like hey the conditions aren't really great so and the, and the way that the sharks are are behaving we, we just, you know, let's, let's try another time. You don't want to force it with marine life. I always say to like, if they want to be with you and they want to interact with you, they will, but you cannot force that. It's the same thing with people in relationships. You know, you text somebody and call someone and you go and chase them over and they don't respond. They probably don't want to hang out with you. So, you know, let it go. And so, you know, approaching ocean and marine life, you know, with that perspective of, yeah, we would love to, but if they don't want to, or if it's not safe, then okay, well, we'll try again tomorrow. We'll try next week. Um, and sometimes that can be a tough pill to swallow when you travel far away and you see pictures and you're like, I want that picture and do it for the gram. So they say, um, but you have to really uh, be careful. And it, it takes, you know, a lot of humility to, to respect them more than you try to get the shot. Um, or, you know, the selfish way of, of forcing yourself upon um, interacting with, with these animals. And it's their home, you know, it, it, this is their home. We're, we're, we're guests. So I always try to keep that, you know, in my, my perspective, my mindset, whenever I'm interacting, even if it's, you know, just a turtle or, you know, anything, it's just like, yeah, this is their home. I'm here. Thank you, like, for allowing me to be here. I'm very grateful for this. And let's do what we can. And if not, then just let it go. Um, and that comes with time and education and then understanding just the ocean and the marine life. And there's so much that I don't know and I, I still don't understand. Uh, so I just tried to, you know, absorb as much as I can. And, um, you know, just it's all about respect. It, it, it's, it's nothing else that, you know, I, I could say, you know, with regards to how we treat these these animals in this ocean. It's just this this is it's their, it's their home and you come into somebody's home and act crazy. You're not gonna, it's not a good idea. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I see it. I love the perspective. That's so epic. Um, from your, from your, uh, vantage point viewing what you viewed, which creature in your opinion, uh, has the higher intellect, the shark or the dolphin? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Uh, I mean, I've read things. I've I've read, you know, just just dolphins are just crazy smart, and the way that they echolocate, um, I've 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 read up on, and and to to be able to communicate and 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 be able to, uh, you know, just interact with each other. It, it's to me, I, I I it's a mystery. I I don't know. Um, I've seen the dolphins being 
for me, a lot more, um, I would say playful, um, a lot more just kind of interactive. They'll swim right up to you and they'll turn around and they'll kind of look at you. And um, the sharks can, I, 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 and I'm not an expert and I'm not a scientist, I'm not a marine biologist, but just from what I've experienced, the sharks, it kind of like just do their own thing. Um, it, it, it depends on the species of sharks too and the time of the year the way that they act um whether they're feeding or it's mating or you know tigers i've seen tiger sharks act very very just just cruising just hanging out just curious hanging out with us and just like coming right up to us and then i've seen tigers you know be very uh you know f ferocious and 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 very like okay yeah we're we're, we're done we're, we're out of here so i think just like people i think a lot of these marine life they, there's different times of the day times of the year and different things that they deal with that dictates their behavior um so to answer that i i don't i don't know i don't know i guess maybe we could ask a science a marine biologist or somebody but um, I, I like the dolphins just because like they're just very they're very more interactive playful and and being in their pods um, and seeing the little babies swim underneath the moms and then they you know swim up and um, it's just it's a really it's a fun thing to watch I think with sharks it's a little bit more intense you really have to uh, be composed you there's certain things you definitely don't do no splashing you got to maintain eye contact always be aware because they're a little bit, you know, they're more sneaky. They'll, they'll come up behind you and you just always have to be very, very aware when it comes to, to the sharks. The dolphins, like I said, it's a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more playful. Amazing perspective again. Um, you, you're extremely well-traveled. It sounds like very well-traveled in the South Pacific, um, you know, with huh. Hawaii as your base. Can you speak to that that location in that region of the world where, where you're just like, I want to go back. That was just the most epic experience, the water quality, um, whatever surrounding it uh, occurred. Um, take us there. Yeah, um, let's see. I mean, I, I'm very biased towards Tahiti. Morea, more specifically, I've spent a lot of time there. I have some good friends there. I usually spend the summers there because that's their winter because in, in the summer hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. So they usually get migratory um, humpback whales coming from Antarctica. Um, I always say like in, in Tahiti, the water there, it's like every shade of blue. It's incredible. Under the water, above the water, the mountains, the waterfalls, the marine life. Um, I, I'm just much more, I'm biased towards, towards Tahiti, considering the time that I've spent there, the people, um, even the food, the, the fish, um, the humpback whales there. Um, it's, it's probably my most favorite place to shoot. Um, it's where I've gotten, um, I would say, some of my best content because of the visibility. And then, you know, there's just sandbars and then you have um, black tiff, uh, sharks, you get the tigers, sh sharks over there, um, oceanic white tips, um, even just spinner dolphins and, and turtles, and like I said, the humpback whales. Um, uh, it's it, it's hard to say any other place that I've been has been better than Tahiti as far as the diving and the underwater visibility goes. Um, I am going to um, Cabo, Baja. Uh, this June. Um, I'm excited to see what that's going to be. We'll primarily be doing stuff with the orcas, um, getting some content and, and, and video and whatnot there for about a week. Um, I haven't been over there. I haven't been done much. Um, Indonesia, um, we did some stuff in the Mentawise, which is a really cool place for surfing. Um, and like I said, Tonga, um, but there's nothing that compares to me. There's nothing, I mean, I just love Morea. Um, it, it's just, uh, there's so much vibrant, uh, the greenery and like I said, every shade of blue and it's just uh, so incredible. Sounds very incredible. Is there a place that you haven't been that you're dying to get to? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, 
I mean, I think Fiji would be a fun place to go. Um, I'm really excited about Baja. Like I, 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 I've seen some content and some stuff there um, that uh, I think would be very, very fun and be able to capture some really great things. I'm not really keen in cold water. If many people that know me, I'm usually the first one to shiver when we're diving and when we're um, surfing. So um, really mostly just places that are warm and, and just um, healthy reefs. I, I've been wanting to get over to Australia. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me that I need to get over there, the Great Barrier and, and some of the different dive spots over there. And we're relatively close to Australia. It's not too far of a flight. So, um, you know, that's some place that I think would be a great, a great trip, um, hopefully in the near future. Amazing. Um, you, you, you are a um, expert in exercise and lifestyle. What is it that, that you do, I guess, daily? Um, what is your routine to stay in shape? Well, if we're talking about COVID, not too good. I haven't been that disciplined. Uh, I've been a little bit more lazy. Um, but on a typical, a typical routine for me, obviously, the food is, is the important things. I do a lot of fish, a lot of veggies. I try to stay away from sugars. And honestly, I really don't do caffeine. Um, as far as like breath holding stuff, I've learned some different techniques um, from different people. There's a guy that I was able to, to talk with for a little while that trains the Navy SEALs. He does a lot of their free diving and trains a lot of like professional free divers. Um, and there's an app that he recommended for me uh, that I usually use. Um, I would say maybe two times a day, but primarily like before I go to sleep to just kind of slow down my heart rate. Um, it's called Apnea Trainer. Um, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, so uh, it's not like a promotional thing, but it, it's a it's a good way to practice and objectively count your breath holds. Um, obviously, that's very important for surfing, for anything in the ocean. Um, if you have to come up for air, you know, in a matter of a couple seconds uh, different, then that could be the shot that you miss, especially when with ocean life and, and, and the whole free diving thing. I do a lot of, you know, just surfing, getting out in the water. That's exercise for me, two, three hours. Um, sometimes we'll go out and do some underwater training. We'll do some rock running. It's one of my favorite things to do. We'll go maybe 20 feet deep, dive down, grab rock and just try to run the bay. Um, come up for a quick two, two breaths and then come right back down and, and, and just kind of track that. Sometimes I'll go out, Waikiki will go swim to the buoy. Um, if I can get in the water, whether I'm surfing or diving or just swimming, it's a great way for me to stay active. Um, if the water isn't really good for that, like storms, you know, I do a lot of jump rope. Jumping rope is a really good way to, to build up the cardio, your postural muscles. It's good for your joints. Being a PT, you know, I, I know a good bit about how the body, the biomechanics and, and what things stress our joints. Um, and I've found that swimming and jumping rope are two of the, the, the best things um, for our cardio, um, for our postural muscles, and then also, you know, to, to reduce pressure on our joints. I'm not a real big gym person. Um, I have a little bit of gym here. I do a lot of body weight support stuff. I don't know if you've seen like the TRX straps, um, body weight, push and pull. Um, I did a kind of a hit training classes. It's called F45. We used to do that a good bit. It's basically, basically 45 minutes of, of training, cardio, body weight, pull-ups, rowing, riding bike, um, you know, different sandbag medicine ball stuff for 45 minutes and short intervals of, of, of resting. I'd much rather like hit training, high intensity body weight stuff than going to a gym and just doing bench press, leg press, you know, squats and stuff. And, and being in the medical field still, I, I see the results of a lot of these heavy lifts and a lot of these different activities that are really wear and tear on the joints. And I'm seeing these patients, you know, they're 50, 60 years old with knee pain that has started since they've been in their 20s and 30s because of what they've been doing, what they haven't been doing. Um, so learning from, from that helps me stay on top of it because, you know, I don't want to age that way. I want to age well. I want to, you know, take what God has given me with, you know, my, my, my body and, and my health and make the most of it. So diet's a big thing. And then just staying active, I try to do something at least once a day. Uh, sometimes I'll take a day where I don't do a whole lot, but um, just getting outside, getting in nature, getting some sun, get some vitamin D and 
using your body weight, gravity, nothing too complicated. So um, in that regard, how many minutes per day? And during your exercise session, where are you elevating your heart rate to? Um, I'm not really tracking too much of my heart rate when I'm exercising. Um, as far as time, I'd say about an hour. Um, if I'm swimming or I'm, I'm surfing, usually two, three hours. Um, if we're doing rock running stuff in the bay, usually an hour and a half. Um, but I have um, a ring. It's called an aura ring. And they um, help track my sleep. It tracks my heart rate, my resting heart rate. Um, it tracks my breathing, my change in body temperature, um, how restful my sleep was. It'll give me a rating based on the REM sleep, the light sleep, the deep sleep. And that'll help kind of dictate, okay, am I ready for, you know, some a heavy session today? Um, or do I need to maybe kind of just take it easy? Uh, so nothing more than usually an hour if I'm lifting, doing exercise, but being out in nature, it's much easier. Time goes by so much quicker. So an hour and a half, two hours. Um, and then I just kind of track, you know, how my body is feeling with, with that ring. It's, you know, like those Fitbits or like the Apple watches, but I'll, I'll show you. It's just a little, it's just a little metal ring. It has a bunch of sensors. Um, I love it. It just, it, it helps give me a little bit more peace of mind. How am I doing? You know, I, I waking up with not much energy, you know, am I getting sick or is it because, you know, I only had an hour of REM sleep last night, um, you know, because maybe I, I ate a late dinner. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a, a way to just objectively track your body. Everybody's body is different and knowing your body and what's good for it and what's what it can handle, you know, for me is going to be different you know, for you and than, than somebody else. But I like objectivity when it comes to my body, you know, weight and, and all those numbers that I was just talking to you about. It helps give me a little bit more confidence um, in just how I'm doing, how, how am I feeling, you know, and relieving that stress is really important just by getting outside. Um, we, have a, we have a basketball court just down the road. Sometimes the guys and I will just go play two on two you know, for, for a couple hours. And I'm sore usually for like four days after, but <laughs> it's a good way to just kind of kill time and just get out like, you know, like you did when you were a kid. Great advice. Great advice. Um, before we, we wrap things up, I, I have uh, two kind of uh, macro questions for you. Um, what is it, uh, what advice would you give to uh, kids, kids uh, that are older, but young at heart um, about, getting into this game, getting into ocean photography, um, you know, they're inspired to do so. Um, what would you say? Get out and do it. Talk to as many people as you can. I'm, I'm somebody that I don't want to sit and read a book. I just want to go out and just do it and try it. Like I said, how I've learned things is by doing things the wrong way. And then you learn from it. And then, it, you know, it takes some humility. It takes some time to accept the fact that, hey, I'm not where this person is or where this person is. And you know what, that's okay. Um, there's times that I will just kind of get off social media because that comparison or, 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 you know, when, when, when social media or when other people are diminishing your motivation, then that becomes toxic. And then, then you just maybe just step away. Don't follow this person or don't look at this stuff because if you're looking at it and not getting inspired, then you probably shouldn't be, be looking at it. And there are certain people that inspire me. And so, you know, I, I, I kind of shatter them. Hey, what are they up to? Hey, how are they doing this? Um, so find the people that kind of find like a bubble of people that will help inspire you, help encourage you. Um, we're not meant to do stuff alone, having a community, um, even if it just takes like, hey, um, you know, so and so, can I ask you a couple questions? Uh, you know, and, and that's what really has helped me is other people inspiring me because I, I couldn't do it on my own, you know, um, and when it comes to creativity, you got to find your own. And, I, and I've always, I've always told myself and said that comparison, a lot of times can kill creativity. You could keep comparing yourself to other people. It's, it, it can kill that creativity. Um, but, you know, just find your own. Find what inspires you. And I guarantee you, there's going to be other people that are going to be inspired by that. It might not be as many, it might, but might not be the ones that you necessarily want and look up to. And like, oh, well, how come they haven't said anything to me or invited me? It's like, oh, who cares? Just find your own creativity. God has made us all different and to see things different. And, you know, the way that I might see 
an angle is different than you or different than, you know, these other photographers and that's okay. And, and when you can find yours and, and just make it the best, you know, make it like the best version of yourself in a sense of, of creativity um, and, and just, you know, do find what you love and just, and just do it. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing more satisfying and fulfilling than doing something that you love and, 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 and having other people love it as well. But it really just comes down to you because being forced into something or wanting to do something because it's a trend, it's like, okay, like that's only going to last for so long. And then you're just going to get burnt out. And then it's like, oh, oh my, I'm just going to let dust accumulate on my camera because I can't do what this person does. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that whole comparison thing, killing creativity, find your own and, and just, and just get out there and just, and just do it. So well said on so many levels, uh, <laughs> you, you, you've seen the, the, I guess the worst you, you, you survived a incredible accident. Uh, it almost brought you down for good you're in a position to answer this question. What is the meaning of life? Can you tell us? Ooh, uh, yeah. Um, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to answer, the meaning of life. I, I, I believe that we all were created for a purpose. Um, some of us don't know that purpose right away. Some of us might not ever, because like I said, we're too into trying to become something that we're not. Uh, I believe that God has given us all gifts and talents and, 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 and the way that we see life. Um, I just learned really just to just, I mean, love people, love yourself and just love people, regardless of, of what they believe or how they are, or, you know, this whole political thing and all this, you know, racial tension and just, you just learn just to just love people. Um, I think everybody's purpose is different, but the one common thing that I, you know, kind of always just think about is just, just the people that are in your life, just find out how to encourage and love them so that they can live the best version of themselves and that you can live the best version of yourself, not trying to spend your life uh, trying to be something that you're not, because that's, that's just gets exhausting. Um, and just accept who you are and just make it beautiful. Um, yeah, it's, I don't think it's a really a one answer kind of thing, but like having a, that type of perspective is something I have to remind myself every day. It's like, okay, I've been given another day. Why? You know, what is my purpose? I think I read something really recently. It said, you only live once. Well, yeah, but you only die once, but you live each day. You live many times. Every day is, is, is a new day of life. You know, you only die one time. You don't live one time. You live every day that God gives you. And so God, what, what can I make of this day? Who can I inspire? Who can I love? How can I make people happy that they're alive? Um, and just, I, I tend to, you know, think about what it was like when I was in my coma and what, it, what I looked like in that bed. And when I opened my eyes, just like every time, every time your eyes open, just be grateful because somebody's eyes just did not open. They didn't open for today, but yours open for today. All right. So what are we going to do with it? And having that perspective helps motivate me, encourages me to just uh, to just love people, love life and just and just go and do it. Because tomorrow you don't know. Just like I went to bed that night before my accident. Did I know that I was going to be in a traumatic head injury in a coma neuro ICU and lose everything, so to speak, and just be sent home with my family with nothing else but love? Like, did I know that? Like, no, I was thinking, what was it going to have for dinner? Or what am I going to do tomorrow? Or, you know, whatever. But um, having that perspective really just kind of helps me, you know? <laughs> Dropping bombs, Jay. So, so incredible, man. Uh, th this, this has been an epic talk. And I know I've gotten a ton out of it. And I'm, I'm sure anyone who ever hears this will also get a, a, an enormous amount of information on this, um, on life on the work you do, on the work they might do someday themselves. Um, I just want to thank you again for your generosity and, and your time here. Uh, I know it's a early morning on a Sunday in, in Honolulu right now, so I hope you, uh, you, you get the most of it. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much. Thanks for reaching out to me. Thanks for doing your research. Thank you for just your very uh, you know, intentional 
with the way you approach these questions. And that means a lot to me, you know, the, to, the, to see how the, the genuineness that you have um, in reaching out and asking the questions that, I mean, I think you've asked every question that I would have like hoped that you would have asked, you know, um, and, and very, very intentional. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for, uh, you know, just sharing, sharing some of that with me. And um, hopefully, you know, we, we, we stay in touch and, uh, you know, a new, new friendship here. Absolutely. I, I enjoy going to the islands myself and uh, I have lots of friends there. So the next time I, I make my way out after COVID, uh, I'll, I'll ring you oh, up for sure. Do it. Excellent, Jay. Thank you again. Wow. Wow. What an epic conversation. Jay is an incredible individual on so many levels. And we thank him so much for sharing his time and great breadth of knowledge with us. Thank you for your time and listening to Speaking From Water. Please join us next time on Speaking From Water with me, Sean Rutke, where we will travel to South Africa. Let us see where we go and who we talk to then. And until then, I wish you the best of luck. Stay wet. Stay inspired. Much love.